Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 14 of Justin and the Food Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm Justin Bizarro. I'm your host, and today I have with me my co-host, my business partner, and beautiful significant other, Deborah Micus. Hello. And today we'll be interviewing Lou Thoman of the Yapon Wellness Company. And uh, Lou, would you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your company? Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. And Justin, thanks for all your support over the last couple of years in social media, the likes, the Instagram likes, etc. I appreciate all that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful feeling to be, be liked. Um, so my name is Lou Thoman. I'm based out of Savannah, Georgia, and I'm the founder of a company called Yopon Wellness Company. And although there's no specific pronunciation we say yopon but yopon is a, a very common uh pronunciation that we get from people so we like yopon but it doesn't it's not it's neither right or wrong our company is uh, i guess we'd like to be known as the yopon experts yopon is an indigenous tree that grows in the southeastern part of the united states mostly along the coastal areas and beautiful marine uh, maritime forests. And um, Yopon uh, is being called by many of the herbalists now in this country the undiscovered or forgotten American medicinal plant. And we are, our mission is to bring Yopon back to the modern consumer while we research its wonderful traditional medicinal value. And uh, so we're pioneering it as a consumer product in the traditional medicinal field or area of products or wellness products. Uh, Lou, will you educate the audience a little bit about the medicinal benefits? I mean, I was fascinated when I did a little bit of research by how great it is for you. Uh, yeah, it's really an interesting plant. So it's in the holly family. Um, it's in the ilex family. So to start with, there are two South American cousin plants, yerba mate, which is pretty popular in the States right now in the world at large, and guayusa, uh, uh, both also out of South America. Yopon is in the same family of hollies. We kind of call it the, the holly trinity of, of ancient, sacred, traditional medicinal plants. In the yopon, we are finding that yopon is a very complex plant. It is very high in antioxidants, those sort of detoxing polyphenols and flavonoids that help detox the body and get rid of those free radicals. It also has, um, it has, well, it's, number one, it's, it's also the only native source of caffeine in North America. So it's full of chlorogenic acids. Yeah, I find that um, fascinating. It, I didn't realize that there was no other native caffeine source. Yeah, you know, Southerners always knew where to get their caffeine during times of uh, economic strife or war. They went into the woods and got it. In fact, that may be one of the reasons it was sort of bypassed. It may have been considered a poor man's source of caffeine or tea. Um but yeah, it's, it's, so it also is rich in saponins, which is a really in, interesting uh, 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 complex of compounds that could be could help with you know blood sugar regulation. Could be an anti-diabetic. Um, there are also some white papers out of the University of Florida, for example, where in vitro the saponins in yopon protected colon cells from carcinogens. So it's really in the very, very early stage of, uh, of research in terms of the, the medicinal values. But we do have a pretty good, you know, catalog of the Native American use as a traditional medicinal. And that's a good starting point. And so how is it that you guys came about bringing your teas about? And it sounds like you have other things in the works in terms of utilizing this plant and possibly other ones. Um, yeah, well, the, 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 begin, the story of how we, how I learned about Yopon is a big part of, you know, our story. And we're a family business. My wife is very involved in the business as well. She's a successful real estate broker. She has her own company in Savannah called Judge Realty. But she is a healer of sorts, and she's been getting, 
more and more into the medicinal value of herbs, including Yopon. And she's a big part of it. But to go back to the beginning, we had a family uh, nature walk on Osaba Island, which is a barrier island off of the Georgia coast, off of Savannah. And Osaba literally means land where the Yopon grows in the original native tongue from that area. And Osaba is a beautiful barrier island, about 30,000 acres. And we were accompanied by a naturalist who is really one of the uh, premier experts on coastal ecology, a guy by the name of John Crawfish Crawford. And we were walking through the woods on our family nature walk, and John said, this is the Yopon tree. It was called the beloved tree by the native tribes in the southeast, and they used it as a stimulating drink called the black drink. They used it medicinally as salves. They used it spiritually in ceremonies. And I was really intrigued. And, and when I was a young kid, I think like a lot of people, there are certain passions and interests you have when you're young. But as you grow older, things get in the way, whether it's you know going to high school, going to college, job, right. marriage, nice. kids. And that just really ignited that old passion when I was a young kid. Uh, junior high, I used to um, read some of the native stories that were passed down, verbal stories, and I might say some of them were pretty wild. Um, and it was just a passion I had about ancient cultures, but particularly Native American culture and traditions. But it was dormant, and when I was looking at this tree, and it, it just kind of ignited that old, old feeling and old interest, and he, you know, crawfish told us about the drink. And I said, well, let's make some. So we did. We picked some leaves and we roasted them at the fire that night. And at the campfire, we had some. And the taste was amazing. And it really made me feel well. There was a little bourbon involved, too. But I did notice the effect. <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did notice the effects of the, uh, the Yopon. It really, really struck me. So when I got back to the mainland, I went into research mode. And I love research. And as I researched this plant and whatever available uh, information I could find, I realized this is an American treasure. This is a big, big story. This is this is um, an amazing story. And, and, and it goes back to the Native Americans trading it to the Mayans for cacao because that another sacred plant like Yopon, Yopon has theobromine in it, which is an alkaloid you find in dark chocolate, cacao. And for example, I found articles saying how in um, the Hokia Mounds in Southern Illinois, they found earthenware with yopon as well as cacao residue. And in the Mayan areas in the Yucatan, they also found yopon and cacao in vessels that were being used to consume drinks. And so the, the history goes way, way back, and the use as a traditional medicinal, medicinal goes way back. And that was a really fascinating revelation about Yopon and, and the ethnobotany going that far back. But there was also a very uh, strong early colonial American experience in ethnobotany um, in the story. Uh, all the different um, uh, Groups like the English had a name for it. The Spanish called it Indian chocolate uh, because there's not, there are natural sugars and it has a sweet note if you brew it just right. And they also, the French called it Appalachian because the Apalachicola Indians taught them about it. So there was also a strong early American experience with Yopon that just added to the ethnobotany fascination to me. So while on vacation with your family, you learn of this plant and... Like, how do you, from that point, decide to turn this into a whole company and teas and bottled teas? How does that happen? Uh, yeah, well, I was just, you know, again, ign reigniting that old interest, that old passion for it. I started picking it. I started making teas. I started going to different charity events and serving it. I, I was giving it out to anybody who would drink it. And I started acting as an ambassador for the tree talking about it and people were fascinated and without exception everybody who tried it wanted more um and 
I got all kinds of feedback. Uh, a, a lady who's uh, or actually a student at SCAD who kind of had HD, one of the HD, well, I don't can't keep track of all the HDDs, but he said it helped him focus, which was one of the Native American, you know, claims that it was used for focus and stamina. Um, that could be the way that theobromine, caffeine, and theoquine all stack together to, you know, give you energy and focus. Um, but I started making it, and I realized that it, it's an important plant. I love the story. The ethnobotany and history just absolutely captivated me. And I realized I had a new mission. So I started, um, you know, selling it small, small time, just at farmer's markets and things like that. And then I started you know, growing, uh, growing the business and realize, I think this is, this is what I need to do. And, so, um, Lou, where were you getting the plants? Were you growing them yourselves and you took that on in Georgia or did you purchase it from the coastal region? No, it was all wild picked. Um, I started picking it myself. Um, uh, we have a small little, uh, river house on an Island called Hurt Island, uh, which is in part of Darien, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And, we had had the house before, but I didn't realize the island was so full of this plant I had recently discovered. So I had a beautiful maritime forest to start, you know, experimenting with it uh, uh, as much as I wanted. I would pick it all day long, and then I had friends picking, and I hired pickers, and would pick it in the woods on Hurt Island, and I would start practicing different process methods and uh, different ways to, uh, to cure it, dry it, et cetera, ferment it. Um, Speaking of fermenting, it may have been the very first fermented uh, drink in North America, too. There is some evidence that it was fermented it, because it does have sugars and yeast in the, in the plant. Um, but that's basically how I started getting my supply. And that is really, you hit the, the, the nail on the head because in order to make this a multi-regional commercial product, there has to be a supply chain. So I started propagating wild uh, yopon plants from Hurt Island onto our farm in Meadow, Georgia, where we are farming it uh, in a row crop formation, traditional row crop. Mm -hmm. And we're, all, we're also exploring different models to produce a scalable supply chain in a long leaf tree plantation in Florida. So we have Georgia and Florida, uh, two states where we're really perfecting a scalable supply chain model, which has been the, the most challenging part of the, the business. So you're growing your own at this point, and then you, it sounds like you kind of perfected your process. Are you actually producing the tea yourself, or have you turned it over to a co-packer? No, we're producing it ourselves. Um, we sell it in bulk form. Uh, a lot of kombucha uh, producers like it because it makes a really, really good kombucha. We sell it to other tea shops who want to sell bulk. Uh, for example, uh, um, uh, Green Sage Cafe in Asheville would buy our bulk product that we process ourselves and send to them, and they serve it over the counter. Um, we also uh, produce our own product for our tea boxes. And we're getting ready to launch again, our ready to drink, uh, which is again using our own, our own yopon, from either the farm, or from the longleaf tree plantation in Florida, which is a fascinating model too, which I can tell you a little bit about at some point. Well, so when you're saying that it makes a great, is it a base then for a kombucha? Because you were mentioning it fermenting. So does it? carbonate itself or does it I mean how does that work I don't know enough about that to really even ask the question properly well it's a good question I, I I'm not an expert on it I can tell you the little I know is that um, because the yopon leaf contains natural sugars and yeast then when you make kombucha with the scoby it has something to feed on um, and traditional black teas don't really have the uh, the, the type of sugar that Yopon has. So as an augmented tea in a kombucha brew, my understanding is they can use less sugar in making the kombucha because they, the sugar's in the Yopon leaf. So it helps in the adding the sugar or reducing the, the need for more sugar. And, it, and then it has its own, own flavor profiles that also 
enhance the uh, kombucha. So you mentioned that it na- it has a natural sugar in it. So several years ago at the Flavor of Georgia, I remember tasting your tea and loving it. And so were sugars added to that, or is that the natural sugar I was tasting? Okay, so you tried our first launch of the Ready to Drink, and we did add a very small amount of um, um, organic cane sugar. Um, and the reason, as much as I didn't want to do that, um, in order to make something shelf stable, you have to add, you know, acidify it. Right, right. Uh, when the pH is above a certain level, so typically um, you do add sugars to modify that acidified taste that you get in some shelf stable products. Having said that, the new version of the ready to drink that we're working on right now, we're using yopon honey to, to, as a sweetener instead of cane sugar. And so is that from bees that are using the yopon flower? Is that how that works? Or is it a honey that you guys are producing for yourselves? Um, just so I'm clear. Um, great question. We hope to eventually produce it ourselves on the farm and on the longleaf tree plantation because yopon is dioecious. It, it's both the male and the female of both flower. It's a fantastic pollinator. So it's definitely part of the mission as well is to create this great pollinating environment for bees right now we are buying the yopon honey from a producer that has yopon on their land now a little tricky because we call it yopon slash wildflower when they're producing the yopon when the bees are producing the yopon honey there's a chance that they may be a gall berry flowering somewhere in the vicinity and a bee may wander over to the gall flower. So we're very, we want to be very precise. We know it's mostly yopon honey, but there is a chance there may be some gallberry um, honey in it. So we can't say it's 100% yopon, although it's close. So we are buying that. I know that's a long, long-winded answer to a short question. We are buying our yopon honey from a yopon honey producer right now. No, I think we're fascinated by the bees, especially with the knowledge that now that's come forth that bees are so important to the human beings and 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 food and how important it is for them to stay around for a long time and us to make sure that we're doing what we can to make sure there are bees so i love that you have the idea of bringing the bees in to the yalpon uh flower and and creating that little micro uh environment there in, in full circle and then using the honey also to flavor the teas that you're bottling yeah and i don't know if um if we're the first to do this but having a, a, a product um with two different delivery systems uh being the the, the honey and the yopon leaf i think it, it's kind of interesting i don't know if that'll be lost on consumers or not, but we sure love doing it. I always love hearing stories too about when entrepreneurs vertically integrate and they handle their own ingredients, their production, their all the way through to their distributing it to the clients. So I think it's a great model. And I always love hearing when people figure out a way to handle all the different components of it. Cause it's definitely kind of different businesses. I mean, there are people who are farmers and there are people who are producers and there's people who co-package and you guys are handling so many different facets of your own business that it's really impressive. Well, thanks. We, we certainly don't know it all. We need help, but we're, we're plogging through it. We're, we're, we're doing it. That's for sure. So you mentioned that your wife does this with you as well. Do you guys have a background in being entrepreneurs or did you grow up in families that had businesses? How did that, how did you decide that we want to take on being entrepreneurs? Well, I think it's, uh, there's two kinds of people in the world, aren't there? There are, there are those that are entrepreneurs and those that aren't. Uh, I don't mean to be, <laughs> I'm not trying to be coy, mean. but <laughs> we, we definitely are. We have that gene. She has it and I have it. And I would, tilt my hat to her as being a, a, a tremendous uh, entrepreneur. Uh, her family is a, uh, her, her parents are, had their own business as well. My parents were not entrepreneurs, but, um, and I started selling things to make extra money at a very young age because we had a large family. So my dad's philosophy was 
you know, we will, we have a large family, so budget is limited. We will help our children as far as they want to go in education and sports in that order. But if you want, you know, a toy to match your neighbor's toy or your friend's toy, you've got to go out and earn it. So we learned at a very early age how to kind of go out and make money. That's great. I mean, that's kind of a lost thing on this on this generation more so. And so I love hearing about that. I mean, I know I even had difficulty getting my children to do chores because I was always scheduling them and making sure they had to get everywhere. So <laughs> it's definitely admirable. I know that I grew up in a family with a similar mentality of limited finances, but also, you know, really encouraging us to work hard. And I, you know, think that's a great attribute. So I'm, I want to back up for a second because I'm curious. You had mentioned the long leaf tree farm in Florida and, and explaining that. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So, you know, I mentioned earlier my preoccupation or biggest challenge has been creating a supply chain. You know, it's not hard to go find Yopon in the woods and pick some, but if you want to have a national product, you know, that that's not going to cut it. Um, so we've been designing equipment to help with a wild harvest of Yopon, and we found a longleaf tree plantation which was basically mismanaged by the previous owner. Um, And when I say that, he didn't, he didn't apply two of the traditional timber practices, one herbiciding and secondly burning. So what happened is he planted all these longleaf trees, um, which is the iconic, you know, pine tree of the South. It's an amazing tree in and of itself. And what happened by not herbiciding and not burning, Yopon has basically crowded out the longleaf pines. So the longleaves are about five years old, so they're probably, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet tall. And the 300 acres is absolutely full of Yopon. So I figured, well, here we go. We're going to manage this longleaf tree plantation a little different way than the traditional model of timber foresters we're going to manage it for yopon as an understory crop so what we're doing is we're clearing out the yopon which is our harvest and as the trees grow it'll also create shade which the yopon likes and increases the size of the leaf and some of the compounds and what we're doing is we're creating a row crop formation underneath the longleaf pines and by doing that we're creating a wonderful wildlife habitat but more importantly we're trying to perfect the model of eliminating the environmentally bad stuff that the timber people do because timber is a great renewable resource but the herbiciding and the burning is really bad for the environment so if we can manage to create this model where we're managing the forest the longleaf plantation for Yopon, we can eliminate the use of herbicides and the need for burning. And that's just a wonderful thing. If if that, if we can accomplish that and we're on our way to doing it, I think that's just an added benefit. And that just happened by, by executing, you know, a supply chain. And at the same time, we're, we're designing equipment to, to take, to actually do a wild harvest uh, in a more efficient way than, picking leaves by hand. So it'll be hand picking, but with, with machinery. And, and then that, so is your plant that you're producing the teas and and stuff in and and harvesting, are you going to place it down there then in Florida or is it something you'll, you'll pick down there and, and then process in Georgia? Well, eventually the plan is to actually build it on site right now a few miles away from the acreage that we have, the Longleaf Tree um, Farm, we have a warehouse with a processing plant. So we are processing there now. And, and just so I'm clear and the audience is clear, are you, uh, do you own that farm now? Is it something you've purchased? We did. We, we own it. Yes. Okay. So it was a, a business decision where if you're going to need this company to grow and potentially take your products nationwide, whether it's just the loose tea or 
the tea or the raw product all the way to the finished product that's in the bottle, the cold teas or uh, supplying kombucha companies, you needed to produce more and you needed to do it in a sustainable way. Is that correct? And that's that's exactly it. And, and to add to that, um, the idea is once this model is sort of um, perfected, then we can do it in multi-states because, you know, you have different weather patterns. You don't want to be susceptible to a Hurricane Michael in one area if, if you need to harvest. So if we're in Mississippi, if we're in Texas, if we're in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, we'll have multiple uh, processing plants and uh, hopefully long leaf pine. Long leaf has become a big part of the mission. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about the long leaf pine, but it's truly, truly an amazing tree that at one time had created the most uh, diverse um, eco biosystem in North America, in the South. And it's been pretty much decimated for different reasons. Um, King Cotton was, was, was come, had come in and they also sold the wood because it's magnificent wood, but it's, truly amazing tree and there is a, a there is a longleaf pine yopon alliance uh in terms of how it grows and how it likes each other it really creates an amazing environment so that's becoming more and more a focal point for how we do this down the road and what's happening now is in terms of the growing the growth model we're doing several different grants we're in the middle of uh, we're actually towards the end of a grant with Clemson Horticulture, Small Business Innovation Research Grant, studying Yopon on the farm in a row crop setting under the different shade conditions, under different fertilization protocols to see what it does. Because in nature, Yopon, like every other plant, is going to struggle or, or compete for nutrients. And one thing about the Yopon tree or leaf it does amazing things if you give it more nutrients. So what we're doing is we're trying to see what we can do with it. We can, for example, increase the caffeine content content dramatically seven to eight times in the field through fertilization. So what we're learning through this grant on the farm, the farm has become kind of a research pilot project. We hope to transfer that knowledge to the longleaf farm, Yopon and Longleaf Farm in Florida and other states as we grow. I mean, that's amazing. So it's, it's did long, you, and long, how did you know about the long, grant or did you solicit them to try and say, hey, this is something I want to study? And they were like, yeah, we'd love to study it too. Uh, yeah, we, um, we, we, we submitted the grant. Uh, it took me three years to do it, uh, to, to be awarded. And now we're, we also were awarded a couple different value-added producer grants. And we're also submitting a couple of the really, really interesting uh, grants set, uh, kind of around the, the genome sequencing of the Yopon tree. And, and that could lead into some real interesting organic natural breeding. Um, so we're, we're really trying to pioneer the research because we think it's, it's valuable. We really, really think it's valuable. Well, it sounds like there's so much to learn and there's so many benefits that we do know of. And if there's even more, that's amazing. You know, so with the talk of all these grants and whatnot, one of the conversations we have a lot with entrepreneurs is financing and how they finance their businesses and if they have to take loans, if they have to bring in partners, investors. And so how have you guys been able to do it? Um, well, we're, we're blessed. It's been self-financed to date, plus um, the grants have been helpful. Um, but but it's, not an, it's not an inexpensive um, enterprise, particularly when you realize not only are you spending money on equipment on the farm level, uh, you're also spending money on equipment for the processing, and you're also we're also spending money on branding and marketing. So it's it's rather expensive. Uh, you know, I do lose a little sleep at night, but if I if I can if we can get it to a point where um, enough people recognize the value and we have commercial products that can sell it, we can either take on, hopefully, a strategic partner or, or finance it through, you know, more conventional ways. I, that story is still, you know, to be, to be determined. Um, one thing I didn't mention is we are opening an apothecary in Savannah, right, in the historic center of Savannah, 
which is going to be called the Yopon Tea House and Apothecary. And what we're doing is we're sending our Yopon to small artisanal makers of wellness products. Um, and we're asking them to make products for us infused with Yopon. And the reason we want to do that is, again, part of educating the public about, you know, the, the magnificent value of this plant and the medicinal value of this plant in different forms. So we see it not just as a tea, uh, but also as an ingredient. And uh, hopefully that will help sort of get us more and more um, awareness and hopefully sell more products as well. And it's kind of kind of creating an experience, experience around Yopon that we hope to recreate. Um, so that, that's another part of the puzzle uh, when you talk about financing. That's not an inexpensive enterprise either. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. We just, had, we, we just had that conversation <laughs> on some of the things to build a store. And it's going to be really, really beautiful and elegant. Um, so when you talk so, about this yeah, apothecary we, and the other uses for Yopon, are they all items that would be edible? Or are they also like topical where you would get oils from it and create lotions for anti-inflammation? Or what all are the types of products you're thinking? Well, if, yeah, if you, 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 you can think of um, cosmetics for sure because of the amount of saponins that are great anti an, antioxidants for the skin in Yopon, it lends itself to really good topical creams, hand creams, face creams, cosmetics, um, lip balms, it's antibacterial. So um, oils, yes, we actually are infusing uh, CBD oil with Yopon. It seems to like each other quite a bit. Um, we also are going to have salves, and we're trying to recreate some of the traditional uses we know it was used for. Um, the apothecary will also have uh, different functional um, tea ingredients and herbs and botanicals to, to compound or mix together with the yopon. Um, so it's really, truly meant to focus on wellness products. And at this point, this may change, but right now everything has to have some degree of yopon in it. And what we also want to do is tell the story of the people that are making it for us. And hopefully that will also you know, build more awareness. And everyone, without exception, we call them makers. The artisanal makers are just blown away by Yopon and its ability, the ability and, and to, 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 to be an ingredient with other wellness products. So is that's there such a thing a as a Yopon product. supplement? Uh, there will be if uh, I have my way. <laughs> Excellent. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the products that you guys currently are producing and, you know, tell the audience where they can actually find these things. Uh, sure. Right now um, we have a, a tea box set, five different uh, Yopon blended teas. It's in a box set. Um, you can buy it on Amazon and you can buy it in different, we're in national distribution with Kehi. And so you can buy it in uh, seven different regions in mostly the small independent health food stores. Um, uh, I would have to say we're in, the, we're in just about every region, but you have to find it in the different sort of independent stores. The ready-to-drink bottled version uh, should be ready to launch sometime mid-spring. Uh, we're working real diligently on that right now, and that will be a national distribution. It should be in, hopefully, you know, the Sprouts, the, the Whole Foods, the Luckies, all the, the, the fresh markets, et cetera. But that's really slated for spring. And then the apothecary is due to open in mid-March, and that'll primarily be the storefront and an e-commerce platform. Um, so we're still working on that right now. And so you mentioned being in Sprouts and lots of different stores. How, I mean, have you guys done that yourselves or do you have someone who helps get you into these stores? I know other entrepreneurs are always trying to find ways to get their products in. Yeah, the whole, the whole distribution matrix is a whole nother science that um, I know enough to be dangerous in. But um, we do have a, a, a master broker and a broker network. Um, some of the big distributors have uh, programs for startups. For example, Kehi and UNFI both have um, uh, different programs at Kehi. It's called New at Kehi. 
and their regional sales forces help you get into stores. And you know, UNFI has a similar program that we hope to be, be in as well with the ready to drink. Um, and then you, you know, you have salespeople. We hope to, you know, be off and running with a sales manager, national sales manager, you know, by this summer. Um, and that's, we're kind of waiting to the ready to drink to be ready in order to justify uh, hiring a national sales manager. So between the distributor, the broker network, and your sales team, um, that to me kind of the, the, the way to do it. But you also have, um, you know, brand ambassadors, you have demo people, you have um, brands like, uh, I think there's one on a Boulder uh Green Spoon sales, their sales group that can also help you. They all have a different, you know, cost model, but um, they all play into the system. And so some of the lessons that you've learned, I I think it's one of the things I want to just point out before I finish asking my question is that how long it took you for to get the grant. And I think a lot of people that enter the entrepreneurial world, um, especially in food, don't understand the, how long the runway is to develop products, to, to get them to market, to then make sure grocery stores or markets carry them. And it's a lot of hard work, and, and obviously the internet and social media helps, but it's, but it's still tough being that people actually have to physically drink or eat your product. So I think that's important. I just want to make that point. So that being said, during this time that you've, you've taken to start this business and grow, what are some of the, the failures you've had and lessons you've learned from them? Well, wow, that's a, that's a good question. I've made every mistake in the book. <laughs> so we, could, we could have an entire, another whole interview on the mistakes. But, but basically, you know, you don't know everything. I, I don't have an ego that I where I think I do know everything. I know when to reach out for help. So, you know, it's been, you know, we're, we're, we're inventing a wheel with Yopon because no one's done this before. So the mistakes are really learning experiences, both on the harvest side, the processing side, the farming side, the branding, the, you know, one of the mistakes, um, I think when we launched our ready to drink the first time, the label didn't really tell people what it was. It was beautiful. The label got everyone's attention, but when they look at it, they would wonder what it was. So the next generation of messaging on the label, I think, is a huge learning experience. You've got to really, and particularly with something that no one really knows, if it was um, you know, an everyday product, you don't have to educate people, but we have to tell people what it is. So We've worked really, really hard on making beautiful labels and packaging, um, but we've worked even harder recently on the proper messaging to, to tell people what the value proposition is, why they need this drink and why it's important and part of the story. Um, that's an important lesson. Um, how expensive things are, freight, for example, is, is, a, is a huge lesson. Uh, freight can really change your bottom line. Um, and also just learning about the different layers in the industry, part, part of what, when you asked about, you know, marketing and getting into, into stores is there's a lot, there are a lot of layers and it's expensive. And, um, I know there, there's, there's lots of lessons I could go on and on. Um, and how about employees? Have you guys, I mean, it sounds like your operation is quite large and multi levels of it. So, it sounds like you both are probably working on this full time at this point, but have you taken on additional staff? I heard you mention possibly bringing a national salesperson. Um, yeah, we haven't taken the national salesperson on yet. We, um, we're looking to do that this summer. We, we have a harvest crew, uh, which is about five to six. Uh, we have an operations manager, um, which is one person. We have a, new utility outfielder. Uh, her name is Risha. She just came to us. Uh, she moved back to Savannah from New York. And she's helping with the branding, opening the apothecary. She's helping in so many ways. Um, her title, we don't really know yet, but we're calling her marketing guru. Uh, <laughs> my, wife has been, my wife has been a huge help on the branding, the aesthetic, uh, just bringing common sense. She has a very successful um, 
realty company here in Savannah. I'll give her a plug, Judge Realty. Uh, so she has great she has great instincts and she's invaluable. And and just having her support goes a long way as well. Um, so she's the vice president. So the the administering the grants, my accountant is doing that. Um, some of the graphic design, we do have an intern, uh, Katie Manning from uh, SCAD is inter- interning for us right now. We'll probably add another intern. Um, and then the master brokers are really acting as our sales team right now. And, and I guess that would be considered a subcontracted job. But eventually we do want our own internal sales uh, people to, to, to support the, the broker network and the distribution network. So we're, we're not really that big. Um, nine to ten people, I guess. It's pretty big. I mean, when you consider, you know, you think of all these startup companies and, you know, it's a lot to bring someone on. Anytime you bring on an employee, you, as an entrepreneur, you know that their livelihood is dependent upon you. So a lot of weight comes with each additional employee you bring on. So nine people is a lot of people to be responsible for. Yes, <laughs> um, I, I agree. <laughs> and And so... That that all being said, how do you you know how do you choose employees? How do you make sure they they fit your model? Do they sort of come to you because they believe in what you're doing, uh, based in the the health space, or is it something you actually go out and search for and and hire and interview? Well, a little bit of both. Uh, if you ask my wife, um, she will say I'm trying to remember her term. She materialized Risha. She she said, we need help, we need somebody, and Risha appeared, and she's just un- awesome. Um, so there's a combination of, you know, searching for a uh, person with the right experience to fit the job, but also there's a certain sensibility with what we're doing. We're, we're really doing some, um, I, I don't know the right term, but it's, 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 it's just real. You know, it's, it's, it's as real as dirt, what we're trying to do, and certain people... That's a southern expression, by the way. It's as real as dirt. <laughs> I like um, it. And it's and very it fitting considering your role. So, you know, a big part of it is the right person that has to be the right fit. You know, we like, uh, but we do need expertise. We need competency. We need, you know, people who fit our value system, but also that have the experience and tools that we need. So it's, it's a great question. And I guess it, it, it extends into, different facets when you look at what you're looking for and a question i like to ask everyone that's been in the flavor of georgia how was that contest for you i know deborah and i were there um and we've been judging for for a couple years now but how was that overall and how have you been supported by the state of georgia do you feel uh, for your business um, it was a great experience. Um, I think we were a little early. I don't think we had our, our game together well enough uh, for it. So hopefully next year we'll be back at the Flavor of Georgia with some really, really cool products. Um, so I thought it was a great experience, good learning experience, and great support. We got good good awareness. Um, we made good contact. It was really well run. Um, met, met some really good people have become friends through it. So I have nothing but great things to say about flavor of georgia um and hope to do it again soon i thought about you know they just had a new uh, registration for it and i just didn't think i was quite ready with the ready to drink which is kind of our flagship line so i didn't didn't sign up for this year but i will next year but great great experience and georgia supports us a lot i really i find good good great support from georgia yeah, I think um, one of the things that I just want to point out there to the audience as we're talking is that, you know, even though there's a deadline and, and it's, it just came up, I don't think forcing a product through or a group of products through is the way to push your product into a market. I think taking your time, I know everyone's in a rush and they, they want to try to get their product out there and and they think it'll be too late if they don't do it now, but taking the time to really put the product out there that you want and is of the quality and flavor and and texture or taste, whatever it ends up being that you want is, is really important. So I want to point that out to the audience for sure. Because when we go prematurely to a market, we often fail because 
we didn't do it the right way and we have lack of confidence in it. So uh, if we have lacking confidence in it, I'd say it shows when we go to speak about the flavor of Georgia or speak at events like the flavor of Georgia, you know, because at the flavor of Georgia and the audience who doesn't know, you actually have to present on your product and you get three minutes to do it. So you basically give a three minute spiel and you can always tell the people that have submitted the product and made it that might not be quite sure it's ready to, to be on the market yet. And the ones who are, are confident in their product. We've actually heard from quite a few of the people who've been on the show that while they were completely ready for the show, what they weren't ready for was the attention they got following the show. They didn't know how to, they didn't have staff to help them follow up with all their leads, all their interests. They had lots of different uh, groups they had met with who maybe wanted to work together, and they just didn't know, they weren't prepared to digest all that came their way, all the attention. And so, but it's a great opportunity for people, and uh, I love that you guys were there, and I was super excited to try your product. I fell in love with it, and I can't wait to try it again next time. So it sounds like maybe 2020. Yeah, hopefully 19. Oh, well, for flavor of Georgia, correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, or you can try it. You can try it sooner. We'll be in the market before then. Okay, we'll definitely look for it. Um, I lost. Oh, I, one of the things I also one I made me think that I know Kent Wolf and the group at the University of Georgia who do the flavor of Georgia uh, as part of the Center of Agribusiness and Economic Development. You know, it brings up a point. What I haven't seen is a health food or a health drink category. And I know they do a lot of the other categories in there, but I wonder if it's something I'll, I'll probably suggest it to them for, for 2020, because I think there are a lot of healthy products that are coming out of Georgia and uh, beyond just the categories. Honey, obviously, is a healthy product and it needs its own category. But there's ways I see Georgia people combining products to make them healthy, like you were mentioning the honey and the tea and things like that that have you know, extra health benefits. So it's something I'm definitely going to suggest. And uh, obviously maybe they'll hear this podcast and I won't have to suggest it. So that would be good. But, um, but that being said, how do you, um, get your product out there to market? Are you sampling at markets and events or is it something because of the nature and, and the health benefits to your product, it's sort of taking a life of its own, and we did talk a little bit about brokers and sales and distributions, but how did you get from from there to here where you are now? Was it a lot of your own legwork and going out there? Uh, definitely. Um, you've got to be out there doing farmer's markets and charity events. And when you are in a store like Whole Foods, uh, when we first um, launched our Ready to Drink, we were in Whole Foods in the South. And we did a lot of demos. Um, and it works. It really, really works, bringing awareness to the customers on, on site, on, on the floor. And that's, that's critical to support the product in, in the stores. Um, it's also a big expense, but it, it's critical. And as you grow, you have to figure out that balance of supporting your product in the market. Um, you know, if, if, if you get the traction and start getting the, getting the velocity in the stores, that kind of takes a life on of its own, but you have to spur it. You have to initiate it. Uh, you know, you, you need those first early adopters to talk about your product. And then, you know, different press that you'll get as a result helps. So it's kind of a, a snowballing effect, as I see it, to, to get the traction and get the awareness and get people to buy it. And Lou, um, as your company is getting bigger and your sales are now nationwide, it sounds like, how do you manage all of your accounts? Well, it's basically done through the distribution network. You know, Kehi, for example, for the boxed teas, um, you you do have to manage their, their paperwork, but they're going to send you the invoices and, you know, the write-offs and, and the different... Uh, aspects of their um, accounting, you know, you have to keep an eye on it because uh, you want to make sure you get paid what, you know, what you're, what you do, but there are also lots of different chargebacks that you need to understand. But that accounting um, from them is really pretty good. It helps. And they also have, 
resources, portals that you can go on and see what stores are selling, which products are selling. So uh, you can be really, really proactive and find out, you know, what's happening store by store through their portals and their information database. And through them, will they do sampling for you if you wanted to really push a product at a certain time of year? Or, you know, will they create an opening for you so you can fly wherever and, you know, do an event yourself at a store? How does how does that work? Absolutely. Absolutely. They love nothing more than having demos. Um, they love it. And they, um, it, that, that industry is changing a little bit. You're seeing more and more companies popping up that perform that service for you. And de- depending on the store, some stores have an internal team that will demo your product if you train them. And some stores uh, prefer that you come yourself or you hire someone to do it for you. But if you have the desire to do that, um, it's wide open. They, they think that's the most useful thing for a startup brand to, to help launch a product. That's, that goes without, that's a huge tool. And so the idea of having a national salesperson someday, um, is that so that overall it financially is more beneficial to the company to do it that way? Well, that's partly it, but it's also you need to have someone 100% in your corner. You know, brokers are great, but they also have a myriad of other products they're representing. So you really need someone fighting for your shelf space, your, you know, getting you into the meetings and the different um, category reviews that are going on. You need someone fighting for you and representing your product 100% of the time. So I think overall that becomes, you know, a value proposition to have someone you know, working for you. And that national salesperson should, over time, with need, build a regional sales force. And these people are the ones who, are, you know, know the store owners, know the people, and, 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 and they really, really help place your product and also find out, you know, get, you get feedback as to what you need, may need to do. You may need, you know, rack cards information on the bottles. You may need a sale a certain time of the year so you know the whole system really kind of functions as a uh, as a juggernaut for your for your product but that sales manager should you know be the spearhead for that that's amazing and so as we start to wrap up i wanted to ask a, a couple more questions the first one is is how has getting into your own business affected your relationship with your wife? And is it something that's brought you guys closer? Is it something that you both are passionate about being both entrepreneurs and how does she help you on a, on a regular basis? What's today? Um, (laughs) She's been, (laughs) well, just having her support um, is great. Now she does have her own, you know, realty company. So she's quite busy with that and, and like I said, very successful, and she's getting into uh, more and more commercial development. So she does have her plate full, but she de- devotes a certain amount of time to helping with the store and with the product line. And a lot, of, and she has an absolute great aesthetic. She's very much into the local art scene, uh, promoter of the arts and buyer of art. So that brings in a whole other dimension that helps kind of build a brand's aesthetic and feel. Um, so she's invaluable for that. Um, it only helped the relationship. She believes in it. It's, you know, it's, it's expensive. It's, it takes a long time. It's, you know, we're not, we're in it, in it for the duration. So it just has added a dimension. We also have a 13 year old, you know, and he's at the age where he's running all over the place. So we have to divide our time and be real efficient. So we find, you know, a, a family meal every night really kind of when we all get back together and, and, and talk and have a nice family meal and discuss what we're all doing and catch up. In the meantime, we're running, you know, pretty fast in different directions, but also working towards the same goal. So it's really helped our relationship. You might have to ask her to verify that, but I think it's really helped our relationship. And I'm really tickled pink. She really came on uh, to help more forcefully in the last six months. And that's, it's been great. I mean, she just has great instincts and I rely on her a lot. Um, you know, I prefer to be in the field 
you know, working on the supply chain and on the farm. Um, and she has a, a, a different sensibility and, you know, she's very precise and thinks things through. I'm, I'm more of seat of the pants. You know, my philosophy is move your ass and your brain will follow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like that a lot. I like that too. Is that Southern also? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I can't remember where I got that one. I think I got that in Jamaica somewhere. Yeah, I have to um, tell myself that every time I try to work out. Just don't worry. Don't think yeah. too much. Just get your ass in there. Yeah, yeah. So it's helped. Plus, our 13-year-old is, is getting a good glimpse of two entrepreneurs, you know, doing our thing. And, you know, he's, as he's getting older, you know, he'll be on a tractor soon. And uh, he was my first kicker to help me. So he's, you know, learning something, I hope. So I think it's, yeah, it's a great question. I think it's uh, just added to our overall, you know, lifestyle in a positive way. Yeah, I think it's a, it's an experience that kids don't get anymore. Um, Deborah and I both grew up in entrepreneurial families where both parents were entrepreneurs. And and uh, on note of the tractor, I think that's huge. I, I For me, it a, was a huge lesson. I think my parents put me on a tractor mowing the lawn at about age two. I couldn't even reach the pedals. I just knew how to turn off the key so I could get off the thing. But <laughs> right. yeah, and, uh, yeah, on a pharma, they put you to work no matter what, free labor. But that being said, I, I, one, I, I really cannot tell you how much props I give for, for doing that and, and just even recognizing your son and and giving him the opportunity to learn because I do think a lot of entrepreneurial attitudes and personalities and experience and opportunity comes from growing up in the business and, and learning and seeing it your whole life. I mean, I know how much I learned just by watching and being a part of it and my parents allowing me to be a part of it. And I think for the, for Deborah, it's the same too. So before I ask the next question, I wanted to give you props for that. And I, I love hearing that for sure, because I, I'm really hoping there'll be another generation of entrepreneurs coming through, uh, particularly in our culture in the United States, since we, we kind of do this instant gratification thing and kids don't seem to get the long term hard work and grit it takes to actually do a business or be an entrepreneur or develop the thick skin necessary to keep moving forward when, when times are, are bad. And so I'm glad to hear that. My last question is, if you could go back to the beginning and tell you yourself something or a few somethings that you know now, uh, what would they be? Um, trust, trust your instincts. Um, work harder. <laughs> um, and, and, and don't, don't let the little, um, challenges get you down work right through them harder just keep keep plugging away if if you believe in it and i do sounds like great advice and so lou i want to thank you for coming on the show again and and being so honest and and telling us all about your story and your family and your lessons um so and and what you've learned from those lessons and that being said, as you open up the store, we'd love to get you back on the show again and uh, before the end of the year just to see how things have progressed with the store. And one of the things we really want to do on this podcast is tell people stories not only once, but sort of experience the growth and the hardships of their, their companies and their endeavors with them so the audience can actually see and feel and hear the emotion of as we move forward. And I think it also gives everyone on the podcast an opportunity to hear themselves and which is growth and if you're willing to learn from it so having that opportunity and being able to get back on the show and 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 perform or or tell your story differently and tell your experiences differently from what you learn is important so we're going to make sure we do that on the show so people can see how people grow and how people learn and how businesses grow because it's not just a snapshot in time here, I want to make sure that we're, we're actually doing a living experience of, of all the entrepreneurs and with what you're doing and how you're growing, I'd love to have you back on the show. Uh, that'd be great. Can I leave you with a little Yopon vignette story? Absolutely. So there's a 
health food store in Savannah called Brighter Day. It's fantastic. And the owner, Peter and Jane owners, Peter and Jane Broad, Broadhead, are great. And Peter is a self-taught herbalist, and he really, really is a force in the industry. And he has his own line of herbal remedies, one we like, Pete's Immune. Whenever we're feeling a little off, we'll buy his little Pete's Immune tincture and put it on our tongue. Well, when I first <clears throat> bottled Yoke on tea, which was the very first of any, any kind, I brought it to him and asked if he'd carry it. And he said, wow, the American Mate. We wanted to do this back in the 70s. I, I, he said, finally, someone's doing this. This is really important, and I will carry it. So we, the first store we were in was Brighter Day. And for us, in the early stages of discovering Yopon, that was a huge validation. Uh, stores like Whole Foods, for example, will, will look at how he curates his store for trends and to see what to put on their shelves. So it was really immensely important to us. So um, my wife and I invited Peter and Jane out for dinner just to thank him for putting us on the shelf. So we went out to a nice dinner and we had some wine. And Peter said, you know, an interesting thing happened the day I put you on the shelf. I said, what's that? He said, well, I went home to tend to my medicinal herbal plant circle, apparently because he does his own herbal remedies. He has an herbal garden that's in a circle with all these medicinal plants, whether it's echinacea, uh, our root, I don't know all the plants in the circle. He said, what an interesting thing happened. He said, I went home to tend to my herbal garden, and right in the middle of the circle, a yopon sprouted. And I said, really? That's, inter that's, that's interesting. And I said, Peter, what do you mean in the middle? And he looked at me and just nodded and said, he said, the exact center. He said, this plant's announcing itself. Its time has come. It needs to be it needs to be in the market. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. It's so interesting. Lots of entrepreneurs talk about validation that comes early on in their businesses that lets them know, like, it's a sign. Like, I got to keep going with this. It's not just me. It's not just a feeling. Like, and I love it. That was yours. Yep. And um, as we get off, I also want to... If you would email us the, the name of that shop and, and the owners, I do want to put them in the episode notes so we give them a shout out. And, and anyone else that you've mentioned on there or your wife's realty company since we mentioned online, if you want to send us that information in an email, I would love to post it in the episode notes under the special mentions category so the audience can click on it and see it if they'd like, as well as the location of your new store and the name of your new store so we can have that as well. And, you um, bet. Yeah. And then lastly, um, how do people get a hold of you? What's your website and what's your social media tag so people can follow you? Okay, the website is yopontea.com. And the Instagram is yopontea company. Uh, the Facebook, and we're trying to get all this coordinated better, but I think the Facebook is Asi Yopontea. And Asi, by the way, uh, means the purifier, which is what Yopon was called by many tribes. But that's the Creek um, word for what they called Yopon. Uh, excellent. And, and thank you again, Lou. I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And I'm Justin Bizarro. You can reach me at justin.bizarro at gmail.com. That's B I double Z A double R O. If anyone's interested in being on the show or, or has any questions or wants to do an interview and tell their stories, that's how you get a hold of me. We are on Instagram at Justin and the Food Entrepreneurs. Thank you again, Lou, and everyone have a great week. Thank you, and thank you to the audience for listening. <laughs> <laughs>